For those who seek adventure, this is the Buffalo Roamer Podcast, sharing the people, places, and moments that make a life on the loose worth living. The thing that's going to stick out to you most is when they open up that plane door. The cold is something like you've never felt. The jungle is so thick. Even if you had a machete, you couldn't get through it. There's a huge blonde grizzly bear. And when it saw us, this thing put its head down, stomped on the ground, and hissed like an alligator. I just crossed this real stretch of desert, and I was really suffering. I'm your host, Will Collins. I'm an adventurer, outdoorsman, and roamer of wild places. I've backpacked the Brooks Range, rafted the Grand Canyon, and have canoed from source to sea both the Mississippi and Yukon Rivers. I live for adventure, travel, fresh air, and diving into the unknown. And now... I hope to share my passion with you on the Buffalo Roamer podcast. All right, we are rocking and rolling another episode of Buffalo Roamer Outdoors. As I record this, I am about to walk out the door and head to Moab, Utah for a Buffalo Roamer uh, backcountry canoe trip. Going to be a blast. Uh, really looking forward to it. So I'm itching to get out the door. Uh, if you uh, want to join us on one of these future trips, check it out at buffaloroamer.com. Okay, today, great episode. Neil Moore is on the podcast. Uh, Neil was on the show all the way back in 2020, episode number eight. Uh, this is going to be episode 50-something. Uh, so good to connect with him again. We talk about his 22 river journey, 22 rivers across America from Astoria, Oregon to the Statue of Liberty, uh, 22 rivers, 22 months. Uh, there was one other 22 in there as well. So, uh, without further ado, Neil Moore on episode 50 something of Buffalo Roamer Outdoors. Neil, uh, great to, uh, great to reconnect, man. Um, uh, it's been... I think it was two years ago. I want to say we talked in 2020 when you were about halfway through your uh, your journey of the 22 rivers, 22 months, 22 states. Uh, so great to great to reconnect. How are you? Really good, really good. Nice to be with you again. Absolutely. So give me a give me a rundown. Uh, give me a, a kind of broad picture perspective. Uh, today is I don't know sometime in September, early September of 2022. It's good enough for me. And uh, so you wrapped up your trip shy of a year ago now or so, right? Yeah, December 14th um, represented uh, 675 days on the water. So I started off February 9th of 2020 and ended up uh, in December, mid-December last year. Okay, very good. And give me a, give me a broad perspective of the trip, uh, of what it was and the, the mileage. I mean, I know, but just for, uh, for a refresher. Yeah, so the the big idea was to uh, was was traver- to traverse um, twenty two rivers and waterways and to connect up uh, uh, these these um, these old uh, uh, thoroughfares, the original thoroughfares from the west coast to the east coast. Um, and so I I, I took in. Um, uh, 22 rivers, uh, 22 states in, in a 22 months. Amazing. And you started from the, uh, the West coast and started on, uh, what more or less it would be the Columbia, right? Correct. Yeah. The, the, the mouth of the Columbia, the most dangerous waterway in the world, the Columbia river bar where the Pacific ocean, uh, crashes up against and that, that great storied river, uh, pushes right back. I know it's known as being uh, like a, a windy area as well, right? Is that part of it? Absolutely, yeah. It's it's uh, the you you start out um, from Astoria. You start at about a hundred miles to get to to Portland, Oregon, and then from there, not long after, you have the Columbia River Gorge, and uh, there's a little town there called Hood River, which is the they used to call it the the windsurfing capital of the world. Um, and uh, the, the sport has some, somewhat uh, evolved, I believe, since then. But yeah, it, it's it's a it's a really windy place in the world. Okay, so you start there through the Columbia, and then uh, through, if I'm not mistaken here, uh, through it through a massive portage uh, over into the Missouri River watershed. Correct. Yeah. So I, I linked up three uh, three big rivers to get there. The Columbia. I came up the Columbia. I came up the Snake. And then I came up the Clark Fork River uh, through through uh, uh, the, the border between northern Idaho and western Montana, um, uh, right the way through Missoula, and then to Garrison, the town where I hopped off to have that that big sixty mile portage over to uh, to Helena, the capital of Montana, to uh, 
to very happily step into the uh, the Missouri River, which was going my way. I, so much I want to unpack there, but first I just want to get through the uh, through the route. Okay, so Missouri River uh, venue paddle, America's longest river, uh, which is just an amazing uh, feat and trip in of itself. Uh, and you catch up with the Mississippi River, which would be uh, in St. Louis, where the uh, where the Mississippi and the mighty Missouri meet to form the Lower Mississippi River. You take that all the way down to uh, the Gulf, right? Correct. Yeah. Actually, I hopped off there in New Orleans and then sort of skirted into Lake Pontchartrain and uh, slowly made my way. Um, so so the whole idea, this big convoluted route, um, it looks a bit crazy when you look at it on, on, on the physical map. But the big idea was to follow the seasons. And so... For, uh, for the second winter, I started off uh, in the Pacific Northwest in late winter, uh, fortunately a mild winter. Then the big idea was to be uh, down as far south as I could get for the second full-on winter. So I was in the, the, the Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, uh, Gulf Coast uh, for, for uh, 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 the second winter. Um, skirted uh, close to, I guess, right, right around 200 miles between... New Orleans and Mobile, Alabama. I decided to uh, to 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 come offshore and actually connect up the uh, the 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 barrier islands. So you have you have Cat Island, uh, Horn Island, you have um, Petty Boy, and you have Dauphine to get into uh, your entryway into Mobile Bay. And then from there. Um, I was uh, basically, for the most part, coming up rivers for the entire second year. I came up the Mobile, up the Tom Bigby, up the Ten Tom. I got to ride down the the Tennessee for a spell there uh, uh, to Paducah uh, uh, to meet up with Paducah, and then from there I caught the the, the Ohio uh, right the way up, and a, a couple side jaunts from from the Ohio. I got to come up and down the Kentucky River uh, just to get a, a nice sense of of that great state of Kentucky and that incredible, incredible river. And then uh, come West Virginia, the Great Kanawha, to come up the Great Kanawha to the uh, to the capital, uh, Charleston, West Virginia, uh, ride her on back and then continue up the Ohio to the source, which is of course Pittsburgh, where the Allegheny and the Monongahela uh, come in and, and form the very source uh, of the Ohio. I came up the Allegheny River uh, to Warren, Pennsylvania, and then uh, over to uh, the Shadow Coin. Sorry, the Shadow Coin <laughs> is how you pronounce it. Uh, from Jamestown, New York, into uh, Chautauqua Lake, the old story Chautauqua Lake, and then uh, from there, Old Portage Road, uh, nine miles, brought me to Lake Erie skirted Lake Erie, the southern shore of Lake Erie, uh, up to Buffalo. And then from Buffalo, um, I was able to paddle half of the Erie Canal. So the Erie Canal is 350 miles from North Tonawanda, which is just above Buffalo, right the way through to Waterford, New York, which is where the Mohawk River uh, meets meets the, uh, the Hudson. And so I was able to paddle half of the Erie Canal, uh, 170 miles, and then uh, Portage, the, the second half, the 170 miles from Syracuse to Waterford, New York, which is where I uh, I met my, my final waterway, the Hudson, and then rode the Hudson uh, on down eventually to, uh, to New York City. Wow. So 22 months, uh, 22 rivers, 22 states. Um, what was the kind of inspiration around this trip and we, we talked to you or I talked to you uh, I want to say it was somewhere around on the Mississippi I believe in 2020 when I spoke with you last for an episode um, but what what uh, what was the gist for all of this what was the why, why go do this and uh, yeah right <laughs> I, I've lived uh, I've lived most of my adult life. Uh, 30 years uh, of of my life overseas uh, between um, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, Northern Africa, and then also uh, the Far East. So 
uh, based in Hong Kong and, and, and Taipei, and then using Taipei and Cape Town, South Africa, as as a, um, a springboard for other adventures on those continents. And there's a there's a um, there's a tipping point with, with with everything in life, but there's this there's this threshold when you when you find yourself overseas as an expatriate. There's a threshold that you you absolutely step across and you become a citizen of the world. And the more you travel, you meet other travelers. So your friends uh, in these far flung locations are are from all around the globe, uh, locals as well, of course. And um, and you you sit down and you hypothesize about what what just might be the perfect location, not not to uh, not to have a um, a vacation. But to to move and to and to to mail your box of of books to and to take up residence and to to learn a little bit of language and the culture and to and to try to really immerse yourself and um, and so for me uh, that map there's a couple places uh, Timbuktu in Mali and Old Delhi uh, uh, there's this uh, old guest ho- guest house just across from uh, across the street from from a mosque in uh, in Old Delhi where where you're woken up at some ungodly hour uh, uh, by the call to prayer, and um, and I just I, I have to get there one day. But but the the the, the big epiphany for me uh, was what if the greatest adventure of my life wasn't Timbuktu and wasn't Old Delhi, but what if it was my home country, my own backyard? And so the 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 big idea was to was to look at connecting rivers uh, coming across. I met a gentleman uh, on my Mississippi river descent in 2009, uh, my first big river trip um, at the Brainerd Portage in uh, in, in, in Minnesota, uh, Dick Conant. And he, he taught me a lot of things, not just about paddling, how, how to go the distance, but also about life. And one of the things he taught me was these rivers and waterways connect and you can connect them. And so... For years and years and years, again uh, back overseas, I was sort of longing. I was hulishing for, for the chance to come back and and do something like the Mississippi River. And but what if I connected rivers? And where would be my point A and my point B? And one night, I probably had too much to drink, and I I, uh, I, I had this crazy idea. What if I went coast to coast? So naturally, the idea was east coast to west coast. You know, go go, uh, go west, young man. The, the Anglo progression of, of the history of this country, um, the settlement of this country. And, but then uh, I, I actually talked to Norman Miller, who administers the, uh, the Missouri River Paddling uh, uh, Group, and the, um, uh, h- talking to him and talking about his, his uh, coming up uh, in 2003, uh, uh, coming up the Missouri River, he said it's it's uh, it's difficult um, physically, but he said mentally, it's so much more challenging because you're paddling for hundreds and hundreds of miles, and you're looking to the side of the river, and you realize you could be walking faster. <laughs> and so I started started to think about that, and I, and then I thought, wait a second, I'm from the West Coast. I'm from Los Angeles originally. What if I went the wrong way? And uh, and so to and I can't tell you the number of times people would tell me on my journey. You're going the wrong way, and uh, <laughs> and then I would I would call back and story of my life. <laughs> this is a, but yeah, so the, uh, the, the the big idea to 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 see the country, to uh, to 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 sort of um, to step into the first mode of transport on the first thoroughfares to connect them up, and to really uh, see and experience and immerse immerse myself into my home country and. Uh, and just to, to go for one hell of a ride. Amazing. I love it. I love it. Yeah, we had, uh, I talked with uh, uh, with Ben McGrath, uh, the the author and, and writer of, of New Yorker and author of uh, Riverman, I believe is the title of the book, uh, about uh, your buddy Dick Conant. And great conversation. That was episode uh, 52, maybe. Uh, but yeah, go back and listen to that one if, if, if this stuff interests uh, interest you, uh, if you're listening. But uh, yeah, it was fascinating talking with him. And he, uh, to me, I know your connection with, uh, with Dick and that whole story as well, but he, to me, 
uh, like so clearly kind of distills the uh, the essence of this weird, strange thing that we do, which is sit in a canoe and traverse a country or, you know, for, for extended periods of time or even for a short period of time. Um, it's, you know, the way he's able to distill uh, just the essence of it, you know, showing up in a new town and being accepted and being, uh, you know, the nuances and, and social interactions of pulling up in a canoe and, and hopping off at a boat ramp and meeting people at the bar and, and them being fascinated with you and you being fascinated and interested in, in hearing their story. And, and uh, it's, it's just such a cool aspect of these river trips is kind of those social interactions along the uh as you say that the the uh what's your term thoroughbred the thorough uh thoroughfares of of the country thoroughfares. right right <laughs> <laughs> uh so it's neat and, and i'm sure yeah what was what, what's kind of your take on and just from a broad perspective uh the experience of the river and of those kind of social interactions like how, how does the the social interactions play with uh, the, you know, man versus nature or, or sitting in the canoe or, 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 or some of the other aspects of it. Yeah. I, I like to, I like to say, and, and sort of believe, um, that, uh, that when you're coming down, um, a river or you're coming up a river, I make a camp by and large on islands. I, I, I love to, to sleep on islands. I feel somewhat protected and, and, uh, and then, um, a journey like this, what it is, it's a perfect blend between town and country. It's a perfect blend between humanity and wildness. And and th th those moments when you're in the wild, when you're on the island, when you're getting to the island, when you when you make camp and you sort of watch, you watch um, the transformation of, of light to dark, and you have you have that far off extreme lightning storm. Uh, lighting up the horizon, and then you have the the lightning bugs, sometimes thousands of them uh, all around. You have the toes uh, pushing pushing these barges with their flashing lights, and uh, at nighttime with the uh, with the um, uh, spotlight, which uh, which doubles uh, with the water, and um, and then you 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 really feel like you've pushed yourself out there, that you've detached uh, from society. You. You, you get to experience the wildness all around you and you get to experience and sort of come face to face with the wildness inside of yourself as well. Uh, juxtaposed with looking forward to that next town, you're, you, you sort of feel like, um, I feel anyway, sort of like the kids from, from the, 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 that, uh, that, that movie from yesteryear, Stand By Me, where, where the younger kids uh, make their way, they adventure their way across the landscape. And, when they get to their objective, which is uh, th this dead kid, unfortunately, was hit by a train, um, the older brothers, the older uh, kids uh, got there first. Um, and the, the, the younger character, Gordy Lachance, he says, he says, it's not fair. He says, we earned it. We earned it. And then he pulls out a gun, <laughs> to, <laughs> tells him to get lost. But, uh, but you feel when you paddle up, and you, you understand this, uh, this feeling uh, very well uh, as well, of course. But when you paddle up to a town, you, you've risked life and limb to be there. And, uh, and it, it's sort of hard to understand, but you feel like you've not only earned it. We don't earn anything in this life, of course. But, but you, feel, you feel so excited to be there. And... And you, you, you've learned about the town, and now you're going to walk her storied streets. These river, uh, these river towns, uh, I like to say uh, that they have a certain grit. Um, they've seen boom times, and they've seen bust. People who live along rivers, they have, um, they have a grit. They have a certain tenacity. They wear it like a brash pride. And, and they're not bullshooters. Uh, not like people from where I come from, from Los Angeles. <laughs> um, there's nothing plastic about them, about their bodies or about their souls. They're real. They're real people. And to be able to have a conversation with them, uh, you, you have to be real as well. And you, you, you feel real. You feel real. And you're interesting for them because you've come from, from a place that they understand. Um, you know, the, 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 there was this one moment coming up the Ohio River where um, – 
uh, there's lots and lots of locks and dams and they actually lock you up, which is nice. But there was one moment just before sundown one night where I was in the, the small chamber, the six, the 600 foot chamber. And there was one of those um, uh, expensive paddle wheels um, sort of harkening back to yesteryear that was right next to me in the 1200 foot chamber. And I got out first and I paddled along the shore river left ascending maybe midway up the, uh, the, the Ohio River. And there was an RV camp to the side and everybody was coming out to, to take a look at, at this beautiful paddle wheel uh, in, um, in concert with uh, Last Light and with this glorious uh, sunset. And this mother with her two little boys, uh, she came out and she said, looky there, boys, looky there. She says, canoes and paddle wheels, this is what the river used to be. And um, it, it, there's just something, it, it, it's hard to put into words, but when you're there, you feel it. You feel it in the wildness, on the water, and you feel it in the towns. Um, it, it's, it's just, it's a priceless, it's a priceless way to, uh, to see and experience this country. Oh man, I can feel it in my bones just from your, uh, from your description right there. I feel like I'm sitting on the side of the, of the Mississippi with a, with a corn cob and a, uh, and and a, and a cold one. <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's great. I, and I I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, I, I've certainly experienced the same thing. And and yeah, whether it's uh, a through paddle like this, or even uh, I've experienced the same thing on shorter trips where you're looking forward to checking out the town and a burger and a milkshake after after getting off uh, the river and and looking forward to a warm shower after whether it's a long weekend or whatever. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's such an interesting, and, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head too uh, with the, yeah, juxtaposition, if I can pronounce that, uh, uh, of the wildness with the towns. And I think that there's something woven within the fabric uh, of the country, of, of anywhere really, of civilization on these riverbeds, right? Uh uh, before automobiles or whatever mode of transportation, the river rivers were the highways of of uh, of the land, and uh, yeah, I, I also think that it's by canoe specifically is an awesome way to see it because I just enjoy the pace of it. It's, I think it's the perfect pace. It's it's fast enough that you can make miles but it's slow enough that you're able to understand and really uh kind of live with the landscape in a way that you're not if you're in say a motorboat or or even something slightly faster you know what i mean absolutely absolutely yeah it's a one of the side notes just to to go to what you're just talking about i find interesting too is the first roads that were built in this country were built along the rivers. Of course, we know the first towns, the first cities were also built on the rivers for a reason. And uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I like, I like the idea people find themselves in two camps, either canoe people or their, or their uh, kayak people or their Kruger people. They're, they're, they're sort of the hybrid in between, which is, which is cool too. But, um, but I, I'm actually with you on this as well, where the canoe, it, it is the first uh, for, for North America. It, it, it's the first, first mode of transport. And there's something, there's something beautiful about it. I mean, to the point, John Rusky, um, uh, on the Mississippi river back in 2009, I, I was able to chronicle a story with him, the, the, the art of the dugout canoe. Um, he was teaching the, these young kids from the Kip charter school in West Helena, Arkansas. Um, the, the art of, 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 of setting, setting your sights, um, ma making a goal like, building a, a, a creating a dugout canoe um and, and then they actually a year later they paddled it across the mississippi and back and that canoe hangs uh in in a place of reverence in their school the idea being you set your mind to something and you can actually um you can accomplish anything that you desire what he taught me that was interesting was uh, on that trip i had a, a old town charles river with the with the the ends of it were sort of the the, the nice sort of swooping um, I'm not sure how to describe it properly. Yeah, tumble home, I believe. Sort of, oh, yeah, very good, very yes. good. Yeah, so they 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 swirl at the ends there. And he said, when you when you when you have that paddle stroke, and you watch uh, the little eddy that it creates behind your your paddle stroke in the water, it's the same design. 
And, uh, and the <laughs> same design some... as, as every time, or it's the same design. It, it swirls in that motion that you find the end of the original native American canoes. Okay. Um, which are replicated with, for example, on that descent, I had the Charles river, which, which, which has those ends, but interesting. Is, is that by chance or, or not by chance? I'm not sure. But, uh, one other quick fact I like is, uh, the human body, um, plus minus 70% water, right? Now, I, I'm no scientist, but what I also know that the, that the, the surface of the earth, plus or minus 70% water. Correct. And I like to think that there's a correlation. When you, when you put yourself um, into, into the water, into the river, when you, when you look at, at, at these, um, these towns and there are boat ramps and you see the, the old timers that pull up in their pickup trucks. I talked to one on the Mississippi uh, uh, on my journey, and uh, I asked him, can I ask you, why is it that you come here to observe the water? And uh, he's clearly from there, uh, multi-generations. And um, the, the way he's, he's looking sort of adoring, uh, um, adoringly, I'm not sure if that's a word or not, um, sort of transfixed, uh, sort of uh, anyway. And what the old timer said, he said, it's a soothing, it's a soothing experience to put yourself near the water. And in, in my life, uh, with lots of stress and whatnot, from the time I was young, to put myself into the water, there's something so beautiful and so uh, soothing about that. Amazing. Yeah, no, I, I 110% agree for myself personally. And I know a, a lot of people can agree with that as well. Uh, for me, the most... Uh, recent thing is yeah i took a trip up uh and took a group up to uh up to the yukon river who you uh you put me in, in contact with a couple group people who are considering uh through paddling it uh, but side note but yeah so i went up there with a group uh a month or two ago now two months ago and um it's it was like i was organizing all the details uh you know doing all the food all the gear and all that stuff and, and these guys were coming along and it was like, it was a good stress, but it was stressful organizing, getting all the details, making, you know, thinking through all the food. Do I have enough food? Do I have enough snacks for everybody? Do we have this, that water filter, backup water filter, um, you know, all of the odds and ends. And then as soon as we loaded up in that canoe and like pushed off, you know, I gave like the bear talk and uh, safety, you know, rundown and, and all that fun stuff. We pushed off in the canoe. It was just like, ah, just like everything melted away. Just like right. look over and smile. And I was telling one of the guys, it's like, you know, I like doing all of that. It's weird that it's a little stressful, but I like doing all the logistics, but this is what it's all about. So, you know, what, once you hit on the, get on the water, it's like, all right, now I'm, I'm in my element. This is where we're supposed to be. You know, it's good. It's good. Yeah. The stress washes away. Absolutely. Um, yeah. <laughs> what, uh, did you have, what, what were some of the challenges on your trip or, or any particular, uh, particular challenge or, or close call come to mind? Uh, there were, um, there were a few, uh, a few times where when push comes to shove, um, sort of unexpected times, you know, you, as you well know, when you're on the water, um, coming down a river, you have to sort of be hyper vigilant. You're for me, I'm always looking for obstructions. Uh, it could be a boulder. It could be a snag. It could be, um, it could be, uh, all sorts of things. R river traffic, of course, as well. Uh, when you're coming up a river, um, it's similar. You're, you're fighting, you're fighting like hell. Uh, uh, a lot of the time, and then, then um, you have you have the nature the, the nature to contend with as well. There was there was a moment um, when I was actually making my way out to Horn Island. Uh, so from Mississippi Springs, right next to Biloxi, there's a, a little island right there along the coast called Deer Island, and I I skirted Deer Island to to the tip, and then. I shot out at an angle uh, to get to Horn Island, which is about uh, 10 miles uh, off the coast. You can't see it from, from, from the coast. And, um, and I knew that even if I missed it, you know, the, the Bear Islands are sort of long and skinny. And if I, even if I missed it uh, in the dark, the Chandelier Islands behind would catch me. And I was shooting out, I got about a third of the way 
when uh, dark, that nice revolution where it was ni nice, nice and properly dark, there was a, uh, a full moon, uh, near full moon or full moon uh, that was rising. And, but before that, uh, to my left, there were the lights of Pascagoula. There's a plant, a big plant right on the water there. One of the reasons that I didn't want to paddle right, right up against it. But I was sort of mesmerized by the lights. Uh, ooh, ah, oh, look at the lights. And then the canoe was hit hard, really hard, uh, three times fast from directly underneath. And I knew I knew exactly what it was, uh, but I didn't I didn't have the luxury to uh, to, to even put that idea in my mind. Uh, it went away and um, it didn't come back. And I continued to paddle. I think I got to the island, the tip of my canoe um, pushed up onto the white crystalline sand right about midnight that night. And, and I was on terra firma and I was safe. Um, talking to locals uh, afterwards, I was told 100% that was a bull shark, that they do what's called uh, a bump and bite um, uh, right, at, right at sundown and again at first light. But then you have an experience like that, that the horror of that, you know, in an open, it's a bit, it's a bit crazy taking an open canoe into open water like this. Um, I, I, I did it because I believe that connecting the islands where it was safer. Also, there was forecast very little to no wind on the coast, which is rare. But we all know uh, in the Gulf of Mexico coming out, the wind really picks up. And then in between these islands, uh, making my way across uh, to connect the islands, you have that stream, that, that current, uh, rip-roaring current that sort of uh, comes through, comes barreling through uh, those skinny parts. And so the, 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 the very next morning, uh, I timed it. So I was, uh, I was at the tip of Horn Island at first light. So that because the wind is uh, is less, as we all know, uh, early or very early on. So I wanted to give myself every chance to survive and uh, to get to Petty Boy Island. And as I started paddling across, you know, you have the brown pelicans. And uh, and then then there was a pot of dolphins. I took video and this pot of dolphins, they were uh, swimming with me, uh, sort of escorting me from side to side. They were under the canoe. They were they were um, ahead of me. And. I felt safe. <laughs> wow. And that was back to back days, the night and the morning. It was. Yeah. Yeah. So That's you have unbelievable. this, you know, we, we talk about town and country and whatnot. I, I, I like to, um, the, the whole, the, the, the idea of happiness, what is happiness? Um, what is success? How do we define success? Do we let other people define it for us with their rules or do we come up with our own rules? Do we come up with our own, our own journey through this life? What is our point A and what is our point B? And we unfurl the map across the kitchen table. We unfurl the map in our mind. When we go on expeditions, um, be them short or be them long or, or it, it, whatever goal we have, uh, what I found early on in my life was balance. It's balance in all things. When you have the balance, um, when you find that balance, um, you have happiness and you have success. And so... Um, between the town and the country, between the shark and the uh, and the and the dolphins, um, uh, with that safety net around me, I found I found that balance right the way across the country, in wow. so many ways, so many beautiful ways where you just smile and you think, "This is it. This is it. This is a good place to be." That's amazing. Yeah, I remember specifically uh, the first time I ran into the uh, Asian carp, the jumping carp uh, on the Mississippi. And one of them slammed into the side of my boat. Uh, at that time, I had like a nice uh, uh, Winona, like Kevlar uh, boat, super thin. You know, it's not as even as thick as that uh, plastic or that Royal X Old Town stuff. And uh, it also makes just that like kind of hollow sound uh, when you hit it. And one of the fish jumped into the side of the boat and man, that's, it sounded like, you know, all hell was breaking loose, like thunder. Like it was such a loud bang just from like this 40 pound, uh, 40 pound carp. I can't imagine what uh, you know, a few bangs from a bull shark was like. <laughs> yeah, it was a thundering. It was sort of a jarring, I guess you could say it was a, it was also a bit scary, but at the same time it was what it was and you deal with it. You don't have the luxury of freaking out. We know this, you know, when you're, when you're coming, there's that descent, uh, right before, is it, um, 
is it Little Falls, the the the, the town in Minnesota, the college town? Uh, is it Little Falls or I'm not sure. Not Winona. I forget now. No, um, it doesn't matter. It, the, 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 there's the bridge. There's the town. There's the bridge, and there's a bit of a. Uh, I don't know if it's class. What is it? Class two? Maybe. Oh class yeah, is I'm it Sauk sure. Rapids? Yeah. So that's it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and so you you go and it sort of surprised me. I didn't see it coming, but you see the boulders below, and then you just you get into this bubble and and you focus and you focus and you don't freak out and uh, yeah. So uh, this is the same deal with the shark. Absolutely. The one one thing that uh, reminds me of that exactly of that a couple times. Actually, once on recently, I was up in the Boundary Waters this summer. And had a uh, a crossing. I took a buddy up there who was not uh, not really an outdoorsman. It was his first canoe trip, and it, it was a blast. But on our last day, we were windbound, and uh, just like you know, in in a big uh, a big lake, super windy. The wind ripped out of everywhere, and of course, everybody else was just hunkered down. Uh, you could see a few camps across the lake, but. We uh, were dumb enough to try and, and, and push through it because we had to get off the next day. So we're making just slow, 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 slow progress. We'd make like, you know, push like 15 minutes and then take off the water and, and wait like two hours until we had a tiny little window and then push off again. But uh, there was a couple times in there where it's the same thing where it's like, you know, you're just fully locked in. There's, there's no other option of because if you're not fully locked in and committed, it's not going to go well. So yeah, you're just fully, completely locked in. And, uh, yeah, the other time I remember that for sure was, uh, on a crossing outside of Memphis on the Mississippi river. I was crossing from the far side, uh, over towards Memphis and super windy that day, kind of white caps on the river and, uh, just like white knuckle paddling. And I remember just thinking like, okay, uh, there's nobody out here, you know, if, if something happens in the middle of this channel on this, you know, overcast day in October when there's nobody on the river, like, it's not going to be good. And you just have to, yeah. you know, lock in and fight through it, right? See your way through. That's right. <laughs> one, one of the funny things, they're not funny, but interesting things that I always think about, uh, at least for me, uh, is when I'm doing different trips, uh, uh, I always... Before you go, you don't know what to expect, right? You know, you can do as much research as you want. Uh, I tend to be lighter on the research stuff and just kind of go figure it out as I go. But uh, you, you don't know what to expect. And I like the idea of, of you know, having a, a blank map that's then painted or filled in as you, as you have visited these places. And hearing you describe uh, all of the, these little river towns and... and uh, confluences and river routes. It makes me think of just like, uh, uh, what may have been, uh, not blank, but a bear map, uh, uh, for you before is now filled in by all of these intricate stories of these river towns. It's just kind of a cool concept, I think. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, one example of that coming, coming up the Allegheny, I, I knew that there was a dam above Warren, um, but I, and I knew that there were, there were, I think there's eight locks and dams. It's 190 miles from Pittsburgh to Warren, where it's going to pull out. And uh, it's a rock bottom, rock uh, and boulder bottom river, just like the, uh, the Clark Fork in Western Montana, which uh, uh, um, I learned quickly on the, on <laughs> my first night on the, on the Clark Fork, they can flash and they can, they can double in size really quickly. But but coming up, what I didn't know, I didn't do the research, sort of like you say, on purpose. I wanted to just sort of uh, cold experience it. And um, I, uh, I didn't know that um, the final dam that I would face on that river was like mile 61, I think. And so from mile 61 all the way to 190 was a free-flowing river against me. And... Um, and I learned only afterwards. I was talking to to, to a local um, uh, Piper Van Ord. Uh, she she, admin, she owns and administers uh, Allegheny Outfitters there in Warren, and she's incredible. She puts, I believe, she puts thousands of people onto that river every year. Hmm. Um, she's ex Navy. She's just uh, she is she's sort of you know heartline and a uh, sinker uh, in love and connected connected to to that place and. 
and talking to uh, old timers along the way as well. Um, one gentleman I got to paddle with for a day has paddled and been intimate with that river for 60 years. Um, of his 83, 84 years uh, 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 on this on this globe. And um, but uh, what what I didn't know as well was nobody's done it. Nobody's come up the river like I'm going back to explorer times. Apparently, uh, not to say I'm the first whatsoever, but people just don't go up that river. But I, I not knowing that I, I, I think was a plus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> when I finished, I was like, Oh, I, I didn't realize that. Uh, now I know why. <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe so. It was, it was a slug, uh, but it was a lot of fun. So beautiful. That's funny. Uh, I love that with your trip and, and, and in particular connecting the rivers, uh, you know, connecting some of these smaller rivers. And there's so many, one of the things when I was talking with Ben, uh, Ben McGrath, uh, on the episode the other day, uh, one of the things that I think is cool is that, uh, you know, he was talking about Dick and, and kind of his, uh, from his words, like a fairy tale type or not fairy tale, but like folklore type, type, uh, story surrounding it. And, and because it's like, if you live in a river in America, you know, he or you or me or somebody, uh, some interesting person could just come pulling up, you know, it, it doesn't have to be the Mississippi river. It doesn't have to be the Missouri river. Uh, you know, the local river right down by me connects to the rock river, which connects to the Mississippi. They're, they're all interconnected and the, the, it's just a huge system and, and you know, veins of a whole, of a whole body uh, of, uh, of the country. It's, it's, it's cool. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> uh, um, what, uh, what, um, what were some of the highlights overall highlights of, of the trip from you? I mean, is there a story or two that always comes to mind as, something that either encompasses the trip or it was just a high, a high moment. Yeah, there's, there's so many, there are so many high moments, uh, uh, along the journey. Um, I think, um, you have the wildlife. I was able to, uh, was pushing off from Saugerties, um, there in, uh, in early December, um, last year. And it was so cold. It was so cold that I, I had to employ my, my face mask. Um, of course, you got the gloves, you got the uh, the snow pants, you got the whole deal. It was snowing off and on, but it was just it was really really cold. And um, up ahead, I was I was coming down the river, along uh, river uh, right descending, and I saw this white bird up ahead. And I thought, okay, that's a that that's that's maybe a pelican. It's maybe a, I'm not sure. And uh, and then it flew. It flew away from me, as a lot of uh, large birds will do. And I realized that's an owl. And then it landed, it landed sort of on, on a point. And I was with the tide coming out. Uh, the Hudson is tidal, six hours up, six hours back, just like where I started on the, on the Columbia is also tidal, six hours up, six hours back. And so I was coming out with the, but I had the wind a little bit against me where it was sort of correcting. And I swung out wide and then I started taking video and it was, it was a snowy owl. And, uh, and then you get to learn about the snow ale. They're born, they're from the Arctic. And, uh, and this one with this close up video, I sort of swooped around. There's about a minute of video really close up and you sort of see it, you know, rolling its head, looking at me, rolling its head, watching its back at the same time. There was a little bit of a scratch on, on, uh, across the one eye. So you, you wonder whether it was in some sort of a, a fisticuffs or sort of, uh, 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 scratch a cuffs, you know, uh, uh, back in the day over territory or over a loved one or who knows, but, um, just beautiful, just beautiful. Th then there's the people as well. Um, coming up the Allegheny, I came to this one little town, um, known as America's smallest city. Nice. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really great. There's a sign there. And there were these kids, there were this ragtag group of kids, uh, in rural Pennsylvania. They're on, on the banks of the Allegheny. And they're playing a pickup ball of baseball uh, with river rocks. <laughs> and there was a there was a girl and these boys, and uh, and it made me think of the Sandlot. And they were just 
laughing and swearing and uh, <laughs> and jib- jibing each other, you know, putting each other down and laughing and and throwing rocks at each other <laughs> within the game, in the context of the game. And they were so tough. And they took a look at me, what I was doing. And and then uh, I, I asked where they wanted to sign the canoe. And then they just jumped right in. A lot of them just jumped in the canoe. And I, I have this picture of them, um, th- th- these kids who just impromptu, like they just jump in the canoe. Uh, those parked up on the rocks there. And um, it, it was just, uh, I don't know, the, the journey itself, you meet, you meet characters, you meet characters from all walks of life. Um, I, I've been put up, um, hosted by multimillionaires on my journey. I've been hosted by mayors. I've been, uh, and, then, and then you meet people uh, going back to 2009, like, like Dick Conant. Um, one of the greatest uh, meetups and, and stories, and he helped to host me as well, was was in this river park um, uh, on the uh, on the Snake River, coming up the Snake River, a place called uh, I think uh, Nisqually John Landing or John Nisqually Landing, and it was this this gentleman by the name of, uh, of Brian Benson. He was he was missing an eye. And the closer I got to him, it was dark by the time I got there. And I was frozen. It had been sleeting, snowing and sleeting the whole day with wind uh, off and on to the point where, like you, in the Boundary Waters, I was out as much as I was in. But I, I would slowly make progress coming at the river. And, and I saw the campsite. And um, I, thought, I, 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 I thought I saw an expensive SUV. And I thought I saw uh, an actual RV. And I thought, okay people are here people are here not of, of substance but people are here who aren't going to necessarily cause a problem during the night or try to rob me or this sort of thing and the closer i got the more that 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 shining sort of veneer faded into the reality of a homeless camp um uh uh this gentleman uh uh, uh, uh brian benson um society would call him homeless just like dick conant but he, like Dick, uh, called himself free and, uh, and sort of laughed and was living exactly as he wanted to live. He said, Neil, come on over. The, 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 the coffee's on. Come on over. And, uh, and he started up this fire. And then, then the other folks uh, uh, came over from the camp as well. And we're all sharing a laugh and we're sharing tall tales around the fire. And I'm warming up. I'm warming up with the coffee. I'm warming up with the fire. And I'm warming up with the conversation and with with a new friend, um, someone who really looked out for me and uh, and and gave me practical advice and sort of encouragement and uh, and it's just I don't know um, all walks of life uh, along these rivers and you never know you never know what's next around the bend. Absolutely, I love it. I found the same thing on my trips as well. And and one of the things. I don't even know that I noticed this, but I remember maybe a year or so or some change afterwards, after I got off of the Mississippi, um, canoeing the Mississippi, uh, I was with my mom and somebody asked my mom, like, have you noticed anything different? And she said something along the lines of, he's like more open and more willing to, uh, I, this, these weren't the words she said, but this was the just of what she was saying. Like more, more open to, I don't know, like hear people's stories or like just chat with people. And I think that is one of the things that uh, that I've taken away is that everybody has a story, and and most people don't get to tell it. And even if the story is not that interesting, some of them are tragic. Some of them are just. Uh, you know, not benign, but you know, th- th- there's something there in every story and everybody, uh, especially when you're a random canoeist coming through the river on a, you know, uh, uh, as an outsider, it's like, uh, it's such a cool opportunity c- to connect. And, uh, and yeah, like you said, all walks of life from, from, uh, the 1% to the, to the, uh, folks struggling to get by everybody is, has an interesting story to tell, I think. For sure, absolutely. Um, how was it? Uh, how was it winding down as you got towards New York and New York City after twenty-two months? Were you ready to wind it down, or were you longing to be out there, or what? What? What did? Uh, what did that whole thing look like? I know you you pulled out right around the Statue of Liberty, right? 
yeah, yeah. The, the Statue of Liberty was my uh, was my end game from the beginning. Um, I wanted to sort of earn a rarefied view uh, of it. I wanted to see it uh, the hard way from coming from the American side, from the West Coast to East. I have to, and to I, sort of meet the people along the way in. Go ahead. Not to interrupt you, but yeah, I have to imagine that uh, similar to, to going to those islands with the bull shark and the dolphins, uh, an, an open canoe, an old, uh, old, old town canoe bobbing around in, uh, in the harbor around Ellis Island uh, is, uh, it's gotta be a sight to see. I imagine that's quite the, quite the turbulence out there. It absolutely can be right before you get there. There's a place uh, locals call it the washing machine. <laughs> for a reason fortunately the the washing machine was was sort of a uh, uh, bitty on bites and sort of uh, a <laughs> uh, uh, that day but it was it was the day before the second to last day I got turned around um, I was coming solo I was getting to Manhattan and um, coming under the George Washington bridge the final bridge of the entire journey and there was more turbulence under that bridge than I had seen under any bridge ever on the entire journey, um, 7,500 miles. And I pushed through the turbulence. I knew that I could. And then you have the uh, water treatment facility on river left descending, uh, the largest water treatment facility in the world, I'm told. It takes care of all of New York City. And it sort of looks like Mesopotamia with these, with these cement arches. And, and then, then you see, the, um, you see the, the, the buoys and you see the... Uh, the, the, the structures uh, 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 in the water just below. And then, then you see how fast um, the, the, the current and the tide is taking you out. You're going at a hell of a lick, but the, the wind and the waves were against me. Um, it was going to be gale force winds the next day, so I had to make it that day. I didn't have a choice. It wasn't optimal, but it was doable, I thought. The canoe was turned sideways, and, um, and for the life of me, I couldn't right the ship. I have this move, this sort of maneuver where I paddle backwards, then I can sort of uh, do this hard move to the right or to the left where I can spin it around and come the right way. And it was the second time on the journey that uh, I couldn't do it. I on tried about 10 day. times. Uh, the final day, yeah, the f just, just before the final, the finale. The finale was going to be with friends. and That, that, okay. was, that was a few days to, to come, but... This was my second to last day on the water, getting to um, uh, 44th Street, so uh, uh, Pier 84. And I turned around, and I, I was taking on water. There's lots of uh, river ferries. It's dangerous out there. And you have these pylons from yesteryear, you know, going back 100 years, all these, all these old piers that are no, no longer there. You have to stay away from them. And um, so I'm out quite a ways in the river, but... I'm sideways and I can't, I can't continue to paddle backwards because I'm taking on water from behind with the wind and the waves. And I got to the point where I did contact the Coast Guard and just to let them know my, my situation, if I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm going to go in the water. And if I go in the water, uh, um, there's nowhere to take out. You can't take out on the side of the river. It's this big sort of uh, stone wall that leads up to that walkway and, and, and bike path along, along Manhattan. And then, uh, and then there's the water treatment facility. You don't, you don't want to be any, anywhere near. And then there's the George Washington Bridge with all that turbulence just beyond. And so I got turned around, and I was talking to the Coast Guard, and they they said, uh, Neil, we're sending we're sending the police. We don't feel comfortable with this. You're taking on water. Um, we're going to rescue you. And so watch out for that. It's going to be a big New York uh, City uh, police boat. And I already saw the police to to my side on the path. A couple of cruisers, you know, with uh, with five five uh, 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 men and women in blue, sort of glaring at me from, from the side <laughs> of the river. That they weren't too happy to, with, with this whole fiasco. Anyway, uh, and then then I see the boat. You know, I'm I'm backwards. I'm facing. It was appropriate. I actually I paddled that day, the last uh, the four miles uh, backwards into Manhattan. Some people said I was going backwards the entire damn trip, but I saw I saw the I saw the the police boat NYPD on the side come roaring, roaring uh, from my left. And it just went right past me and it never stopped and it never came back. <laughs> and it, it had threw one hell of a wake. And, um, and that was my, 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 my entry into New York City. Ah. But then uh, I, was, I was fine. I was able to turn around eventually and, and under my own steam. Uh, and did you have it. any more contact with them? Yeah, I, I actually, I got to a place where it was, I was pretty frantic and I got to a place, I mean, not frantic, but I was, 
I was to the place where I was pretty sure I was just going to have to tip in uh, because I was taking water. I was trying to keep it straight. I was trying to get the water to bail. There's a reason people don't have open canoes <laughs> in, in, in New York Harbor there. It's, uh, it's crazy, uh, the amount of traffic and everything else. But anyway, um, then, then I got to uh, a, a boat, a, boat um, a little harbor. And, and it was a, sort of this uh, um, a cement entryway into it. It was empty. I learned later that they were doing some construction, I guess, inside of there. So, and it was, it was past the season, so there was nobody in. And um, I was actually talking to the people there for the Manhattan Kayak Company. They were with me on the phone uh, helping out with, with really great practical advice. Always listen to locals. You know, to local knowledge will save our lives. And, uh, and so I asked, do you think I can pull in? They said, yeah, sure. He said, sure. So I pulled right in, and I got out of the waves, out, uh, uh, out of the white caps and the, and, and the wind against me. And there, just by chance, was this couple uh, doing their hike along, along that hiking path. They, they walked up to me and they said, hey, we saw you struggling out there. Uh, where are you headed? And I said, well, I'm going to um, Pier 84, which was probably another mile, maybe a mile and a half. And, um, and they said, okay. And they, they looked really quickly. They said, we also paddle. Uh, and they said, uh, you, still have, you still have 40 minutes of tide. You can make it. And so here are these locals telling me exactly what I needed to know. And so I got back out, and by coming out, I was able to right the ship and come straight. So the last mile getting in uh, to Pier 84 to set up, uh, I was right. And, um, and then, then came the final day, uh, December 14th. Friends from across the country that I, was, I, I had paddled with, I had shared maybe, maybe, uh, you know, uh, maybe half an hour, maybe an hour, in some cases two or three days with some of these, uh, some of these friends, old friends and new. Um, they came in and there were about 10 of us and we got to finish off together. It was sort of the big idea for the journey. Was, it wasn't about me. It was about, it was about us. It was about us as, um, as families. It was about us, the family of, of paddlers. It was about us as, as, uh, as communities and exploring how not just the rivers and waterways connect, but as how we connect as people as well. And, Going out together, I was surrounded. I was surrounded by love. I was surrounded by people who actually knew what they were doing. And, uh, and I was safe. It was a picture perfect day. We couldn't have asked. It was about 60 degrees, um, little, little to no wind, and it was just beautiful. I was the only schmuck in an open canoe. Everybody <laughs> else had uh, ocean going uh, kayaks uh, by design. And um, so, uh, they escorted me uh, to, to the statue at the end. Uh, they, they, they slowed up so I could, I could do the final approach on my own. I paddled forward. And at first I was yelling. I was screaming. I was so excited. I was yelling, bloody hell, bloody, bloody hell. <laughs> I was just so excited I could hardly stand it. And then, then I saw the fire. I saw the stone fire, um, the, the very beacon hand of the Statue of Liberty, of Lady Liberty there. And when I saw the fire, I, um, I missed it up and my face got all sort of scrunched up and I realized that I was going to cry. I was trying to hold it in. And I realized right then and there, I was an idiot. You know, I, I said I wanted to earn that, that view. I wanted to really see and understand it. And I realized that the fire, that that flame, um, that that love had been with me the entire way across, across the country. From the very beginning, I had friends who came out uh, from Astoria, Oregon, to, to be there uh, at the very end uh, for me and with me uh, together. And all the way across, all those smiles that we get as long-distance paddlers, all the smiles and all the waves, uh, you see people helping people. People assist you, and you're able to, to document, witness and document people helping people along the way. That fire, that illumination was with me right the way across. And and it came, it came almost like you know the end of your life, Hollywood style, rapid flashes, right before you die. I felt, and this might sound ridiculous, but I felt all along the journey that it felt like a lifetime. It was only two years, or just shy of two years, but it felt like my whole life. I had always been on the journey, and I would always be on the journey. And and to get to the end felt a little bit like death especially that second day before it felt very much like that. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, 
but but there I was, and um, and it was beautiful. It was just beautiful. I couldn't actually properly cry because there was a media boat with uh, with these cameras in my face, and uh, and <laughs> Ben was there too. So I was sort of embarrassed to cry, but cry properly. But inside and and um, internally, I was trying to process the whole thing, and illumination came to mind. Um, the illumination right the way across a journey like this, when we put ourselves out, just like your mom said, you, we put ourselves out as paddlers, as adventurers, as explorers, and we meet new people. Um, the whole idea, what, why, why is it? Why is it that mankind made their way from Eden, um, uh, from from Ethiopia, from from the very birthplace uh, 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 of mankind that we know? Lucy, the missing link, who who had the who had the chutzpah to stand up, to stand up, plumb perpendicular, and make her way across the landscape. We walked out of Eden. We walked out of Africa um, on foot. Uh, Paul Salapak is replicating that journey right now for National Geographic. Interesting. I think he's in his what his ninth or his tenth year now. It's just just absolutely amazing what he's doing. He's going from Ethiopia. To the end of the world. Holy cow! Tierra, I don't know about that Tierra one. There you got to look that up. It's Jeez. incredible. But, but mankind also made their way across the water. They put themselves on the water. We know, we know they came across um, uh, um, uh, all, all all sorts of waterways. Um, they came to Crete. They came across the Red Sea. They uh, we know people uh, who are, who who are going making their way right now uh, across oceans. Um, and wh why do we do it? There was a great National Geographic article and what it ended with, sort of the punchline was, we have to push ourselves into the unknown. There's something, there's some, the gene, there's something genetic about us. There's some ingredient uh, inside of us sort of pre-programmed where we push ourselves, we push ourselves. And by doing so, we detach and I would argue we learn, we open ourselves up to new experiences, to new people. And, um, and when, you, when you're able to witness the, the majesty, the grandeur, the, 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 the life-changing sort of excitement of, um, of experiences uh, like that, um, these people, these towns, these rivers, uh, they will change your life. Amazing, amazing, well said, well said. Uh, What's, uh, I, I know you had to book uh, about your Mississippi River trip uh, down the Mississippi. Is that the title? A really creative title. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> down the Mississippi, yes. <laughs> uh, you, ha you have another book as well about your, uh, your youth. Yeah, uh, sort of coming of age against the backdrop of apartheid era South Africa. Um, so I was, I was uh, in, inside, I, got, I was invited to live inside the black townships. Um, of South Africa for two years, the, the years in between Nelson Mandela's release from prison and his ascension to power when we had the one man, one vote um, uh, in South Africa. And so to be there during that uh, uh, transformation, to see it and to try to process and understand and write about it was, was pretty cool. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, so Obviously, you're a writer, a journalist. What what have you done, if anything, with this trip? Or what are your aspirations, if anything? Did you document it? Did you journal? Uh, obviously, you've been speaking with journalists uh, like myself and others along the way, and, and sharing the story. Um, what what uh, where, where it is? Where do you stand with all that stuff? I'm working right now to try to uh, try to process all of it and put it into a uh, book form. So the the um the the mo for this journey you know i was paddling uh across the landscape in in the wild uh, uh for the most part in the wild sort of 10 to 1 uh camping out wild by myself um during during the era of covid-19 um covid uh sort of dropped uh, that when the penny dropped and we all understood that it was real um the states of oregon and washington on either side of of the of the Columbia River, where I found myself uh, locked down, uh, shelter in place orders by Governor Brown and by Governor Jay Inslee, uh, in lockstep and rightfully so. I was somewhere in between on a federal waterway. Um, to try to to try to uh, uh, process and to try to write about this, um, it, it, it's it's exciting. It changed up 
it changed up the MO in the past, like the Mississippi River in 2009 during the, 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 the Great Recession. I was trying to highlight, um, highlight the, the, the human face of the Great Recession, walking into towns and pulling off stories of international consequence again and again and again, um, right the way down that river that year. It really worked, but I couldn't walk into uh, a first people re reservation. Um, I couldn't introduce uh, myself in, into communities that, that I would have uh, otherwise on this journey. So it all changed where what happened was I simply documented all of the chance encounters. Again, we talk about the people from all walks of life, from, uh, from Native American people th th that I met uh, uh, on the rivers along the way, sort of uh, out there wild um, uh, and the fresh air to, uh, to, 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 to all sorts of people. And and to try to document this interesting time, not just with COVID, but with this this disconnect, um, this this political sort of savagery, um, where where we're fighting tooth and nail, uh, we're just going back, you know, uh, almost to the Civil War, the brother against brother. How many families have been ripped apart by by partisan politics uh, uh, in the last couple of years? And so to to sort of bridge that divide not put yourself above that or to think of yourself as being above that, but, but to really um, get down uh, into, into a craft like a canoe or a kayak at, at water level and to be able to, 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 to connect, to come through and strip off um, these masks, the masks of Republican and Libertarian and Democrats and uh, this person and that person and to, and to come through and to really try to experience people and to and to uh, experience this country um, just just by observing uh, observing us uh, uh, in our natural state, um, uh, what was really uh, it really worked. It worked. It worked in a beautiful way where I was able to connect. When you connect these stories, like like exactly what you do with your podcast, you're on number 50, 50 something now. Uh, tonight and um, but all these stories one by one by one it's a unique slice it's a unique angle a unique take but when you when you string them together when you weave them together you've got this tapestry you've got the real america the real america it's not you and it's not me it's um it's it's the immigrant experience it's the um it's the it's the rags to riches. It's the it's the riches to rags. It's the it's the it's the people like Brian Benson who come down to the rivers to make them their home during the summer and then go. Uh, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> vice versa. They, they, they go up to the mountaintops to hunt and to sort of to be wild uh, and, and to experience the the, the majesty uh, of, of this land uh, in the summertime. And then when the snow comes on, they come down to the river. Um, you you have I don't know you have th there's something there's something beautiful beautiful about trying to string it all together and uh, I feel like I was able to succeed in just being able to 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 strip away my mask and to strip away sort of uh, to to not point the finger and say these people or these people it's it's us it's us uh, uh, the, the, the the human the the, the human condition. Um, and the, the human experience, and it's something. It's something to celebrate, and I think it's something that's beautiful. So I'm working on the book, and, and we'll see what happens with that. I love it, man. I absolutely love it, and I know that, uh, or at least I've seen, uh, just following your stuff on social media, you've been doing a few uh, speaking engagements and stuff like that as well. Yeah, yeah, a, a couple small talks just uh, um, uh, uh, for fun uh, with with, uh, with friends friends along the way. I was just in uh, uh, New Haven. Uh, Missouri at Paddle Stop, nice. uh, Paddle Stop, uh, 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 Missouri there. And so th this is where uh, I was able to bring the canoe. So, so the canoe is actually on display there now. I was able to give a, a speech just, just in front of some friends. And it was incredible. I've been invited um, in December. I'll be coming to the Harvard Club uh, in Boston, the storied traveling expedition club that have been around. This is their, I think, 120th year. Um, wow. Perry, uh, uh, Shackleton. Um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, when he came back from Africa, all the great explorers have addressed uh, 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 these folks. And 
to step in and have a chance to connect with them and to learn to learn about their stories too uh, will be cool. So yeah, looking forward to, to some speaking speaking engagements down the road too, hopefully as well. Oh man, that sounds like a blast. That sounds like a uh, just a cool uh, cool atmosphere to to soak in and and, and be a part of. For sure, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, hey, Neil, thanks, thanks so much for uh, for taking some time to chat. I've uh, I've, I've really enjoyed enjoyed the conversation. Uh, in, anything you want to leave people with, or anything more that I didn't uh, didn't touch on? No, just I think uh, paddles up and uh, and and here's to adventure. Very cool. Nice to be with you. Absolutely, Neil. Thanks a lot. And there you have it. That is Neil Moore with Buffalo Roamer Outdoors. Don't forget to check out the website buffaloroamer.com. Follow us on social media. We got uh, trips coming up. Uh, we'll be planning here in 2023. All kinds of cool stuff. Go get some fresh air, and we'll talk to you next time. Bye.